Okay, so um, today I go beyond what we said, uh, what we talked about last week, uh, last uh, last session, sorry, uh, last Monday. And I'm going to talk about unsupervised learning. So it's, always, so it's a second lecture about high dimensional inference in networks and unsupervised learning with neural, neural nets, which um, basically is a set of techniques which is uh, developing very fast right now. And you probably have heard about deep learning and the main, many applications of deep learning. So I'm not going to talk about deep learning because I think it's important to know a little bit about shallow learning before going to deep learning. So this is maybe less fashionable. But anyway, so, uh, and also I want to insist first on the notion of unsupervised learning. Okay, so what do I mean by unsupervised? So here is the idea. So let me take the, uh, yeah. So when we have data, there are many things that you can do uh, with the data and when you learn the on the data. So um, just to give a, a very simple idea of, of what is unsupervised learning compared to supervised learning, Imagine, for instance, you are given a set of pictures. So you are given, given photos of chairs, there are old chairs, and also of sofas, okay? And the question is whether you can actually learn the concept of chair compared to the concept of sofa, which is basically the same thing, except one maybe is a bit wider, softer, or whatever, than the other. But anyway, um, so supervised learning is the thing we are accustomed to. Uh, most of the time is the following. So you are looking for a machine, which will be trained, which sets some values of its parameters by looking at the data. And what you give to the machine is a, is a set of pairs of input outputs. So what you will do is that you will give for the machine, each time you will give a photo of a chair and you will say it's a chair. So you'll give the corresponding output. So you'll do that many times. So there will be many examples of chairs and you do that also for the sofas. You'll give this photo and say it's a sofa and so on. So there will be many, many uh, examples like that, input, output, pairs. And then, hopefully, if the machine is powerful enough, if the training is well done, then the machine will be able to give you the right answer if you present a new image which was not in the database. So that's called supervised learning. It's supervised because the machine knows what it should uh, output for the examples in the database. And then it has to find the right uh, function mapping the inputs onto the outputs, okay? So what I am interested in and what we started two days ago uh, is not supervised learning, it's something different, um, which is called unsupervised learning. So basically you are given, for instance, the same thing, so a set of, of images of chairs, and you are not given the output. So what your machine should do is try to make some kind of representation of this object. And this representation should achieve different goals. So uh, so what are the goals? Let me try to be a little bit more pre uh, precise. So one goal we already f uh, saw on Monday um, is that this representation, the way the machine will represent the data, um, um, should actually be uh, useful to find maybe some important statistical features in the data. So for instance, you would like to do some clustering or dimensional reduction. So dimensional reduction, that's something I already talked about on Monday. And we uh, talk about principal component analysis. Do you, do you remember? Yes? Okay. So the idea was, for instance, if you have data which are highly dimensional, so what is the dimension of the data here? So suppose, for instance, I take a photo of this chair, and then I will discretize it in small pixels, for instance. So each pixel will have a color. So we'll have, I don't know, maybe thousands of pixels, uh, millions of pixels. Each one will carry some integer number uh, let's say, characterizing the, the color. And um, so it would be a very high dimensional uh, space and each point in this space would correspond to one particular photo. And now it may, it may happen that actually this huge dimensional space is actually much simpler in a way that there are some subspaces of lower dimension where all the points light or are close to this subspace. And principal component analysis is the way to find these subspaces. That's what we talk about on Monday. And the question I had was actually, uh, we, we studied in detail was, is it actually possible given the amount of data we have and given uh, to, to find this particular direction? Remember, that was, the, and I talk about the phase transitions on random matrix theory uh, in this context. So that's, that's, 
So a good representation here means that instead of giving x1, x2, x3, and so on, which are all the values of the colors of its of pixels, maybe you should plot the data in these coordinates here, which are the projections along the principal components, and then you get something which is much more meaningful, and you will find some structure. Okay, that's one goal. Another, so that's, that's a good uh, way of interpreting the data. But there is an, another goal, which is a, a good way to process the data. And let me give you this trivial example here, which are Roman uh, uh, numerals here. So if you want to write down a date, for instance, or number, four-digit number, so 1984, for instance, that is written in, in Roman neutral, uh, uh, numerals here. And the problem with Roman numerals is that, of course, it is inadequate. This is a, a precise representation. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between the usual way to write numbers uh, and the Roman way. But this is a very inefficient way. And in fact, you have to invent symbols each time you change. You know, you go from 10 to hundreds to thousands and so on. You have to invent a new symbol, which is very inefficient and obviously doesn't scale well. And for instance, something which is very nice here in the usual way of writing the numbers is that just by looking at the number of digits, we know immediately the order of magnitude of a number. Well, here that doesn't work at all. So for instance, if I look at uh, 1,000, let's say 2,000, that would be MM, which is much shorter than this one. Okay, so there is a huge work of decoding in order to actually understand the meaning of that. So it's a very bad representation, okay? In fact, the system was lost and is not used anymore except in a very specific application. Okay, so, um, so this is what I mean. So let's see how good representation can be, can be found. Um, in fact, the, the, the last goal maybe of, of finding good representation of data is that the machine should be able also maybe to generate new data. So for instance, if we have a machine which has good representation of the set of chairs, then it should understand how to have some variability in the representation and maybe generate new chairs or new pictures of chairs which are not in the database, which are somewhat different from what is in the database. So the generative aspect of the model is something also which is very important. And I will give you a concrete examples of that uh, this afternoon when you will try to learn machines which uh, from sequence uh, data from protein sequence data, and we'll see how this machine can actually generate new proteins, which are not natural proteins, but which are functional. So I will show you some examples of that. So it's a concrete thing. Okay, so today I'll talk about two things. Um, I talk about, let's say, one, one subject, which is how neural network-based methods uh, can be applied to do unsupervised learning. And I talk about um, autoencoders, uh, and uh, dictionary learning, so it's going to be something very elementary. I'll try to give you the, the basic ideas, so, but of course, if you want to do practical application with that, then you have to go to literature and find papers and examples, but there are a lot of tutorials also on the web, but I think it's important that you get the basic ideas, and you see how it's connected to principal components analysis we have studied last uh, Monday. And then I go to another kind of machine, which are more connected or which are closer to what we are used to, you are used to in statistical physics, which are called restricted Boltzmann machines. So uh, basically, it's a, we'll do some steps toward these things which will remind you of the Ising model. I, I hope you all know about the Ising model, right? Yes, so you will see there are some version of the Ising model, and there are some connections about some, some specific uh, version of the Ising model, which is called the Hopfield model, which I will uh, introduce. Okay. So, so let me try uh, first to uh, tell you about autoencoders. Okay, so autoencoders are this simple architecture. Let's say this is the simplest version of autoencoders. So what is an autoencoder? So autoencoder has two parts in the world. You have encoder. Encoder means give me some input, I will build some representation. So I will encode the input into some representation. An auto means uh, that actually this representation is, should be able to reproduce the input, okay? So what do I mean? So suppose you have an, some input layer here. So usually we represent um, the nodes here are some units, so they will carry, for instance, the values of the colors of a pixel. So if you have, let's say, 1,000 by 1,000 pixel images, you'll have one million such nodes. If it's a black and white image, so each node would be zero or one, otherwise it could be a real number, integer number, whatever. So they are called the input units. 
Okay? And the number of hypnotic units is the dimensionality of your problem. So the architecture of the machine is the following. So you have one input layer of some, of some dimension P, which is usually very large. And you have one output layer which is identical in dimension. It contains exactly the same number of, hidden, of, uh, of units. Sorry. And now the idea is that you present some inputs here on this layer, and you want to collect something, some state of activity on the output layer, which is as close as possible to the input layer. Ideally, they should be identical. So of course, then the machine could actually take all the nodes here and just copy the values. But that you are not allowed to do. That would be cheating. You have to go through some intermediate layer, which is actually short. So that means that you have to reproduce the input values by going through some kind of bottleneck. And the, so the information is somewhat compressed and extracted in the intermediate layer here. That's called the hidden layer or the representation layer. And you have to do that in a very efficient way so that even if you are losing a lot of units here, the dimension P prime here of this layer is much smaller than P, then what you get on the output when you reconstruct the output from the representation is still quite faithful compared what, to what you have on the input layer. Yes? Uh, in the unsupervised learning, uh, you have made the clusters. Uh, means yeah. uh, means um, on the basis of the pixels of the picture. What uh, physical parameters you have chosen there? Well, I mean, I don't, uh, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean by physical parameters. What do you mean? Uh, in uh, unsupervised learning, you have made clusters on the basis of something. So what is something? Yes, because you know the label, you know the output on supervised learning, right? Yeah, we know the output in the supervised learning, but yes. in unsupervised learning, we don't know the output. Yes. So on what uh, basis you have made the clusters means uh, oh. sense of the... Yeah, so, so there are two things here. If the representation is adequate, okay, so I get many, many points, each one corresponds to one particular one, one data item in my, in my list of, uh, of inputs. All of the yes, for instance, the, or, or maybe, I mean, I don't know, or maybe I'm given this, you know, I'm given chairs and sofas, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that these ones are chairs and these ones are sofas. So you, obviously we know, I mean, we just look at them. But in some cases you will see, uh, in protein it's not obvious to understand that there are subclasses in the data, for instance. Okay, so we are getting that, and you would expect that if a machine is good, then it will be able, for instance, to make some clusters of points which correspond to chairs, okay? So if the machine is good, it will do that. So sorry, here, oh. sorry. Here you have four clusters, but you could imagine there are only two. Then the question is how I, I put the color. Yes, so the color you don't have. But the, cl the, the cluster, they will be done, I mean, automatically by the machine. Then once you see the clusters, okay, because, you know, two sofas, when you look at them, they are somewhat similar, right? They are more similar than to a, another chair. So you would expect that if you have a good way of representing the data, the point corresponding to the sofa should be close to each other, and the chair should be close to each other, and in between there should be some space. So you will ha have two clusters. And then once you get the clusters, you can look at the clusters and try to understand what they mean. No? Is it clear? No, it's not clear? How do you? Can you say it loudly? Yeah. Okay, so again, so for instance, if I have a, an image, so this is a photo, right? And there is a chair on the photo. That's a very bad chair, but suppose you agree with me, it's a chair, okay? That's the best chair I can do. So now, if you look at the uh, file on, in your camera, this is maybe, you know, um, 
Now, I don't, I don't know how many pixels you have, but I mean, you have million, millions of pixels. Just to have a simple number, maybe it's a 1,000 by 1,000 image, okay? Not such a good resolution, but it's okay. So each pixel here will be some number which correspond to a color, okay? So X1, X2, X3, so X1 will be, for instance, the number in this pixel. X2 will be this one, X3 will be this one, and the last one here will be X1 million. So you see, it's a one million dimensional space. I represent only three directions, okay? And each thing is one, each coordinate is the, is the color. So if you are black and white, which is a simple thing, it will be only zero, one. So you are in the, on the one, dimension, one million dimensional hypercube, okay? Is it clear what these directions are? And now you are given all this stuff. So each, each image is a point. And the question is whether maybe since the chairs are more or less similar, maybe that you'll get some clusters of points corresponding to the chairs. And... Sorry? Uh, yeah, I mean the string, yes. Is it clear? Okay. And if there is some structure in the data, and in fact the data had the class of chairs and the class of uh, sofas, you would expect that that to show, show up somewhere in this representation. Um, I don't know what I did with the... Uh... Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me start with the autoencoder. So again, uh, on the input layer, I will give this vector of uh, x1, x2, x3, so. Okay, so the first uh, input here will be x1. So, for instance, so it will be the color, I mean, some integer number, it will be 0, 1. This is x2, x3, and so up, and then the last one will be x1 million. Okay, and then what I want to have on the last layer is exactly the same image, or at least as close as possible. Yeah? But I want to do that with a machine which actually is not simply copying the input onto the output, because that would be obvious, but you want to go through some representation, and this is symbolized by this internal layer here, this representation layer. And here the units will take some values, but the, the important thing is that I, I'm computing the values of this unit from the input, and then I'm computing the output from these values here, of these intermediate units only, without using the input, and I'm trying to match as close as possible the output with the input values. Is it clear for, for the goal? Yes? Yes, so you will see the connection with, yes, yes, in a non-linear way, but I do on the blackboard the linear case, which is very similar to PCA, yeah. Anyway, to principal component analysis. Um, yes, so you mean because you will have some representation which is, uh, Yes. Well, except that, yes, I agree, but except that here we have a, so the P would be the dimension, the number of, yes. There is some connection with that, yeah, except that here P is actually the dimension of the item. I'm not talking about the number of, of samples here. But, okay, but you can see this well, so. Yes, you want. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because simply, I mean, you, I, I'm, I'm trying to make this more precise just in a, in a couple of, uh, of seconds, but you are. Just because you see, you have the number of units you have here is very small. So there is no way you can uh, represent accurately something which is very highly dimensional into something which is very low dimensional. Yes. That won't work. That will never work. If there is no structure in your data, if you have a bunch of random points, then you cannot reconstruct a bunch of random points in a very high dimensional space by knowing only, you know, two coordinates, for instance, in, in a plane. That, that will never work, okay? Yeah. 
Okay, so now I have to make this architecture more precise and say how this is what, uh, defined precisely. Okay, so here V is the input vector, and then you have to compute from the input vector, you have to compute the hidden layer vector, the representation vector, and this is usually written in this way. So uh, for each unit here, so let's say one, the hidden value of this unit, I mean the value of this hidden unit will be H1, and it will be uh, computed by applying some, uh, by computing some dot product of the weights here with the uh, input vector and taking some uh, nonlinear function. So let me be, maybe I can write this on the blackboard so that you see it. So this is the input. So it goes from V1, V2, up to Vp. This is the first hidden unit, which I one. And it's connected to all these input units through some weights. Okay, and this way I call M11. This one will be M12. This is M13, and so on. So each weight has two indices, one index for the, which corresponds to the index of the uh, hidden unit, another one which corresponds to the index of a visible unit it is connected, I mean the input unit it is connected to. And H1 is defined as a function of a sum of a Mij, Vj, and then there will be some nonlinearity, some function of that. So essentially that means that if I look at this hidden unit, it is connected to the input layer through a vector of connection. I'm computing the dot product of this vector connection with the input vector. It gives me some number, and then I apply some function. It will give me the values of this component. And then you do the same thing for H2. But of course, H2 has some other connections. So H2 will be some function. They are not necessarily the same. It could be F1, F2. But I mean, let's make it the same just to, for simplicity. F2, J, V, J. Is it okay how it's defined? Because again, if I want, if I want just, to, if I go from the p-dimensional to the p-dimensional, what I could do is that I could just have, you know, some vertical connection. Each uh, output unit is just looking at the value of the input unit here corresponding and just copying this value, and that. I am. I am. Oh, I see. But 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 I'm not sure I understand. I mean, if you if you have f1, f2. No, I understand. I understand your point. Well, I mean, basically, because there are supposed to be neural nets. I, that would be the short answer. So uh, a, a real neuron, I mean, an idealized real neuron, um, is actually collecting some information from other neurons, okay, and which is some kind of weighted sum of the activities. So it, uh, and then well, it depends on the timing. Here we have no timing, so let's say all the inputs are incoming at the same time, and then it's computing its state according to the weighted sum of these inputs, and then there is there will be some nonlinearity. So it's really inspired from the neural net architecture. You could imagine more general, general architectures, yes. Yes? Oh yes, you can use the Fourier coefficients, yes. Yes, so, so usually this, exactly, so usually these nonlinear functions are, you know, uh, I mean, you, you can choose whatever you want, but I mean, real ones could be uh, monotonic function of the inputs. So for instance, you can say that 
f of u, where u is the argument, if you think in terms of uh, real neurons, u will be the input current. Can, can you read or is it uh, invisible? Ah, it's too far. Okay, so maybe I can raise here. So for real, so for real neuron, so let me do it here. Maybe it's better here. So for a real neuron, um, f is a function of the argument of f. So this would be the input current. How much current the neuron is receiving at some time, you know? And f of u will be the firing rate. So how many spikes uh, this neuron is emitted by, by second, for instance? How much time it is active by second, a frequency of activity? And usually when the input current is low, then the neuron will be inactive. And when it exceeds some threshold, it becomes active. And the more current above the threshold, the, the more active it is. So essentially, you have a curve like this. That's a typical curve, but you could imagine other things. I mean, that's an artificial neural net. Okay? So f is something. Actually, I will do a computation on the blackboard where f is just a linear function, just because it's simpler. Okay, so and once you have your vector h, then you apply the same kind of uh, transformation to get v prime, which is the output. But of course, the connection in between the hidden and output layer, I call m prime, they are not necessarily equal to the connection between the hidden and the input layer. They could be anything. So at the end, let's say formally, if you have one input v, you compute m dot v, apply f, so it's a, it's a vector, apply m prime, apply g, which is another non-linearity, uh, non and then this is your output state when you present v on the input, and that you would be to be as close as possible to the input v. <coughs> so we can define some discrepancy as the difference between the desired configuration, which is the input, minus what is on the output layer, squared. Okay? And we compute the average over the database. S is the index of a sample. And that you would like to be as small as possible, so that means you should choose M, M prime, and maybe also F and G to make this as simple, as, as small as possible. Is it clear for the goal? But with the condition, obviously, that P prime is much more than P, so that you cannot change. So how this is done in practice? So in practice, well, it's a function of many parameters. And what people do, they do, they do gradient descent. You can compute the gradients. It's, um, it's a bit ugly, but it's not complicated. And then you can do gradient descent. There is no guarantee of anything. That is, it's not a convex function generally. It's, it's just horrible. And then you can see what you get and try for many starting points and so on. OK? So. Let me see what happens when we do that in the simplest possible case when f and g are just linear functions. So here again, the architecture. No, no, p prime is going to be small. <coughs> yes, I mean, of course, this thing should depend on p prime, and then it will decrease as p prime increases. But then at some point, there should be some trade-off. You would expect that d as a function of p prime should go down and then will go to low values for p prime much more than p. If it doesn't do that, then it means it's just meaningless. Okay. I agree. OK, so let me do that in the case, the simplest possible case, so exactly the same idea, but when f and g are just the identity. So that means they are just linear function, right? So we can do this calculation on the blackboard to so we'll see what it, what it gives. OK, so let, <clears throat> let me do a calculation. So I will assume that I'm, I'm feeding the network on the input layer with some configuration V. And uh, for uh, simplicity, I will assume that the average values of the, of the Vs are equal to 0. That actually is not a big uh, assumption, because it could be compensated by some offset in the linear function. I have a linear function. I mean, it doesn't have to, to, to be equal to 0 and 0. It, there could be some offset. So it can compensate the average value. So, so it, uh, it makes my life a little bit simpler. And then there will be also some two-point statistic, vi, vj, 
which is the covariance in the data which I'll call gamma ij. Okay, so I have some samples, and they are drawn from, for instance, the multivariate Gaussian distribution, which has these statistics, or it could be any other distribution. The only thing which matters here are the, the first, the one point and the two point statistics for the calculation. Yes? Yes, so, okay, so in my particular case, I will assume I have many samples, okay? So essentially, I don't care about the problem I was, I was interested in on Monday, which is what happens when you change the number of samples. Suppose you have many, and see what kind of architecture you get. Okay, so the number of samples is supposed to be very large, so that it doesn't make any difference if you compute the, the real statistics of the distribution of the one from the samples you have. Okay? Yes, that's true. So take it from the, from, the, uh, from the data. That's a good approximation. Okay, so now what I want to do is that I want to compute uh, the squared error, epsilon squared, uh, which was um, defined in the previous slide. So that's the average of a different squared. So this is what you, I would like to get. This is the input. And this is what I get on the output layer. So that was um, h of d times m. So, and to, okay, so just explain, let me explain this in a better way. So again, I'm copying the machine. So this is the input layer. I have V here. This is our dimension P. Uh, here, this is the same dimension P. And I will do the calculation because I'm lazy in the case where P prime is equal to one. And I, leave you as an exercise the case p prime equal to 2. And if you understand how that works for p prime equal to 2, it, it works for any p prime, okay? So that means I have a single unit here, which I call h. And this is connected to the inputs through some weights. And to keep the same notation, uh, the weights connecting to vi here will be mi. And here I have also some weights and the weights connecting to Vj, or let's say V prime J, will be M prime J. <coughs> yes? Yeah? That's H of V times M prime, and you're right, and this thing is simply V dot M. Is it okay? And this is average on the data, so over the data, so I have many data I want. Okay, so this is obviously a function of m and n prime. And I want to make this as small as possible. Okay, so let's compute it and do the minimization. So it's a, it's a very simple calculation, but it, it gives you some idea. Okay, so um, maybe to have a, a more transparent notation, I will have. I will introduce back the components, so it's a sum. Of, so this is the norm square, so it's the sum of the i of the squares of the difference of the components. So this is vi minus sum of the j vj mj times m prime i, and the whole thing is squared, and this is average over the v's. Okay. Okay. So I can expand. So this is the average of a sum, so it's a sum of the average. So I can expand this. Okay, so let me see the first term. The first term will be vi squared. vi squared, if I average, I get um, gamma ii. And then there is a sum of the i. So it's a sum of the i of gamma ii. Okay, and then I have the double product here. So I have a sum of the i, a sum of the j, mj m prime i. And then I have the average of vi vj, which is by definition gamma ij. <coughs> and then I have the square here of this term. <coughs> and then it's sum of the i. So the square gives me a sum of the i m prime i squared, and then there will be the square of this term here. 
And the sum of this term here, uh, the, the, sorry, the square of this term here, it's a, it's a sum squared, so it's a double sum. So it's a sum over, let's say, two indices, which I call J and K. And we have a MJ, MK, and then VJ, VJ, VK, which is gamma JK. Is it okay? Okay, and I want to minimize this on the uh, vectors n on m and n prime. So we can write the, um, um, just the derivative, that the derivative should be equal to zero. So let's do that. So I keep on this blackboard. So let me um, compute first the derivative with respect to um, mi. So this should be equal to zero, right, at the minimum. Okay, so. That gives me here minus twice sum over j, gamma ij, mj prime. So of course, this matrix is symmetric. So you should not care about the order of the, of the, indices, in the, of the indices, it doesn't matter. So I get the first term here, and then I have to differentiate with respect to m here. So I get plus, so I'm changing the indices because here i is, uh, is so it's a sum over l, ml squared ml prime square, and here I have a twice sum of it, um, j, gamma ij, mj. Yes, yes, so, uh, so I have many, many, uh, it's, it's, if I have many of them, it's of, of, of over the input distribution. Yeah. Is it okay for the uh, equation here? So we don't care about the factor two. And let me write this in terms of vectorial notation because it's a little bit clear. In fact, I didn't need to introduce the components. I just wanted to make all the steps very clear, but could have done it in vectorial notation from the beginning. So I put this on this side. So it means that gamma applied to the vector m prime should be equal to the norm squared of m prime times gamma applied to m. That's the first equation. Right? So now let's do the second equation. So now I want to optimize my error over m prime i. These are the connection from the hidden layer to the output layer. Okay, so that doesn't depend on anything. So here I have minus twice sum over j, gamma ij, mj. And here I have to differentiate here. So this term is a constant term, so i just copy gamma j k m j m k and this is multiplied by twice m prime i okay so again and this should be zero so again uh, if i write in terms of vector vectorial notation which is uh, nicer this is simply gamma applies to m and here this is proportional to m prime so i get gamma m should be equal to so this is the quadratic form. Um, so this is m dagger, so the transpose gamma m, which is a scalar, times m prime. Okay. Can you erase on the left side? I don't think you need it anymore, right? Okay, so I will erase everything. <coughs> okay, so it's, it's very easy to solve this equation. So let me look at this one. So the first one is gamma m prime proportional to gamma m, but I have a value of gamma m here. So I can just put the second one into the right hand side of the first one. So I get simply that gamma m prime should be equal to the norm squared of m prime times uh, m transpose gamma m, which is another scalar, times m prime. Okay? So let me make some assumption about uh, gamma here. 
they are not very crucial assumptions, just to make my life a little bit simpler. I will assume that there is, obviously this is a covariance matrix, so all the eigenvalues should be positive. So I will assume that none of them is equal to zero. They are all strictly positive. Otherwise, you get some vectors in the kernel of the matrix. Okay, so I will assume that there are eigenvalues, lambda 1, larger than lambda 2. I mean, all negative, yes. There could be zero eigenvalue. Here, no, no, it cannot be negative. If you take a, a you know, because if I take a, a vector, you, you can build the quadratic form, for instance. So let me, for instance, if you write, this is any vector x, and you see this is simply, right? So it has to be positive, but it could be zero. Sorry. Okay, it could be zero. But I'm assuming this is not the case. I'm also assuming that the, there is no degeneracy. All the eigenvalues are different, just for simplicity. Otherwise, you, it's a bit more complicated, but not very interesting. Okay. So in that case, it's obvious that since this is a scalar, that means that m prime is an eigenvector of gamma. Okay, so let me call w1, w2, and so on, the eigenvectors all normalized of gamma. So that means that m prime should be um, sum of one of these w's. Let's call it w alpha, okay? <coughs> and, and then there will be some, some, num some scalar in front of that. Some scalar. So it should be proportional to, to, to w alpha. So of course, if I rescale m prime by some number, and I rescale m by the inverse of this number, it doesn't change anything. So I can always choose one of the two numbers. So for instance, I can choose that m prime is w alpha. Now, if I know that m prime is w alpha, that means that gamma m prime here is actually, oh, let's say you can see it here, gamma m is, w, is proportional to w alpha, okay? So that means that uh, m is also proportional to w alpha, because the eigenvalues are not degenerate. Okay, so that means that m is proportional. And for the coefficient of proportionality, uh, here, if m is, uh, let's say, cw alpha, you see here I will get lambda cw alpha on the left-hand side. <coughs> here, this is w alpha. And here, I get lambda. And I compute this thing. Uh, c squared. C squared, sorry, okay? So that means that C is equal to one. Okay, so I get this thing here. So they should be equal. In that particular case, the output weights and the input weights should be equal. And they should be equal to one of the eigenvectors of uh, gamma matrix. So which one? Well, we still have to minimize. I mean, any choice is a local minimum. We have to find the best one. Um, so if you compute, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I erased the, uh, the, the things here. But if you compute, you, so you put back this expression inside epsilon squared. And if you compute epsilon squared, you get, you remember there was a, a constant term, sum of the i gamma i i, which is actually the sum of the all eigenvalues of lambda beta. That's a trace. And then you have a minus a double product plus the, the, the other uh, square term. If you compute the whole thing, you find this. So it's very clear that this epsilon square is minimal when I choose alpha equal one, that is, I subtract the top eigenvalue. Okay? Yes. That was the term sum of i gamma i i. Yes. So we have to choose one of the w alpha, and now if I do it, I get this. So the best thing I can do in order to minimize my error is alpha equal one. I cannot do better than that. Yes, of course, if this sum is large, I'm subtracting only a tiny piece of it. It's a huge deal, but, but I, my architecture had a single hidden unit. So as an exercise, please do at home what happens, look at what happens when you have two and three, okay? You can guess what is going on, right? 
So what did, what did I do here? What did I find? I found exactly what we introduced two days ago. I found principal component analysis. If, you have a, if I give you a vector, a p-dimensional vector, and I'm telling you, what you can do is compute one scalar, one real number, and that's it, and try to reconstruct the original vector from this real number. The only thing you can do is project onto the top component, and then you look at the projection, and that's it. That's your best approximation. That's your best one-dimensional approximation. That's obvious. I mean, we could have guessed that, but I think it was nice to do a calculation. Yes, that's true. That's true. So principal component analysis is equivalent to a linear autoencoder. OK. So work out the p prime equal 2 case, please. <coughs> yeah. So another application I want to do is that uh, here, essentially, I want to map the input onto the output, which is somewhat a little bit trivial, and we found that. So one nice application is what people call denoising. So I don't know if you have heard about denoising. So denoising is, a, is the fact that, suppose I take a picture of a chair, maybe my camera device is not very good. Uh, and this is a case when you have experimental data, there are some errors in the data, in the experimental device, because you have a limited accuracy and so on. So the idea is that you would like a machine which is able to remove the noise introduced by the um, experimental device. That would be wonderful. <coughs> so the classical autoencoder is you have V, you have some representation H, and you would like to reconstruct V, right? That's what we have done so far. But now maybe actually there is some intermediate step is that you have the real V, which is the real chair. You take a photo, and the photo will be blurred. There will be some noise. So what you have on, in, on the input layer of your machine is not V, but it's some corrupted version of V. So for instance, you have V plus eta. And you may assume eta is some kind of random Gaussian noise, for instance. Well, it depends on the, on the device. So that means that the statistics of eta is eta i in average value is equal to zero. And maybe eta i, eta j, the variance would be some number eta squared delta ij, where this is a chronic delta, means that they are independent for, this is zero for i different from j. And you introduce this in your machine, and of course, you don't want to reproduce the same data with the noise. You want to reproduce the true v, the one before the photo was taken, right? So the question is, what kind of weight should you put here in order to, in order to get the best approximation of v rather than v plus eta? So we can redo a calculation. I'm not sure I will do it because it takes a little bit of time. It's very easy. Please do it as an exercise. I have a, a note here. So what you find is essentially, so in the case of a single unit again, so it's, it's very easy to do. It changes, a, so you get in the different terms I had here before, at some point you see a new term coming in on this noise. That's in the, there was this M transpose gamma M. Now it's M transpose gamma plus eta squared times the identity M. Then redo a calculation. And what you find is, again, that the weight should be proportional to uh, the um, eigenvectors of gamma. But then there is a, a slight change in the normalization. The two proportionality coefficients are not one on one. But the one of the coefficients is smaller than one. It's lambda over lambda plus eta squared. So of course, if you have a single hidden unit, that doesn't change much. But now what is interesting is that when you have many, when I say many, I mean p prime is large compared to 1, but small compared to p. It has to be very small compared to 1 million, otherwise you wouldn't get anything. So what is interesting, as you go to higher and higher p prime, you will start to pick up lower and lower eigenvalues in your spectrum, right? And then at some point, this ratio here, which may be very close to 1 for a very large eigenvalue, gets very small if lambda again gets comparable to eta squared. So that means, yes. That means at some point you have to stop. So that means that p prime is actually here fixed by the comparison of the lambda of eta square. So if you look at your spectrum, you see where is eta square, and you can cut all the, le the left tail uh, of a spectrum because they are just irrelevant. So it's a way to fix the value of p prime here in this particular case, which I, I think is a nice way of thinking about p prime, denoising. 
Okay? So please do a calculation. It's a, it's a straightforward uh, extension of what I have done. <coughs> Actually, the only thing I need here is the two point statistics. I don't need higher order moments. I just need that the average value is equal to zero and the, the two point correlation is some matrix. It, it, it's not necessarily a Gaussian. Yeah. I mean, if it's a Gaussian, it's, it's, it's very nice, but it doesn't have to be a Gaussian. OK. So, yes, there was another question? No. OK, so, um, but then we are, it looks nice, but if you think about it, yes, please. Yes, absolutely. Then it's much more complicated you know, to do the, the um, I mean, calculation because I wouldn't be able, but I will show you some, some examples of that, what happens when you have non-linearities. Yeah, so, so if we think, yes? I agree, but I mean, if I don't know and I do gradient descent of this confunction, the machine will do it for me and it will do PCA. Right? So I know the outcome of, a, of this running procedure. It will just extract the top eigenvector. Right? In, in, what you do in practice is this. You have this, you have all your data, so this is the average of the data, and you minimize this stuff. What I'm saying in the case of linear autoencoders, you will find exactly the top components of the distribution of the data. No. Yes. It basically extracts the structure from the data. And this is the, the, the very basic principle of, uh, of unsupervised learning. But of course, you have to find a good architecture and maybe good function and so on in order to find clever representation. It's not true that the machine will do everything by itself, right? You have to be clever in the architecture. Here, it's a very simple thing. But it's nice that, you know, it, it's another way of thinking about principal component analysis in, this, in the linear case. Exactly. Yes. Yes, I agree. Exactly. Exactly, and you see that the whole world is, is opening now. So I'm trying to follow some kind of, you know, uh, trail, maybe a little bit messy trail from the first lecture to this. Yes, exactly. Okay? Okay, that looks nice, but, you know, in many cases, um, when you have this... Um, so how, how should prime be? I mean, essentially, we have some ideas about P prime, sorry, but if we have a lot of eigenvalues which are comparable in sizes, or in, in value, in amplitude, then P prime, in order to get a good reconstruction, should be large. Okay? But that doesn't make any sense. If we take P prime large, then we don't gain anything. So we want P prime small, and we would, we would like to have good reconstruction. And it seems that the two objectives are a little bit incompatible. So another idea came out, uh, which is called sparse autoencoders, which is a very nice idea, and which is very popular now. In, in many, actually, when I talk in the second part of it, talk about uh, Rancity was Banishi, you see it's basically the same idea which is coming over and over, again and again. So the idea is now, let's say, release the constraint that P prime should be much more than P. So P prime could be actually equal to P or even larger than P. Of course, then you say, okay, what is the point? The point is that um, you have a large representation layer, but you force that most of the units in this representation layer are equal to zero for any input you present. So this is the idea. So um, now this layer is very large, and this is still exactly the same machine as before, but now I'm saying that a lot of EHEs here should be zero or very close to zero. So what does that mean? That means that I have my inputs, and then I have my representation. The larger the representation layer, the more powerful is my machine in terms of representing the data. But I'm, so that's good. So I have a lot, uh, I have a lot uh, of possible different representation which can accommodate for a rich structure of the data. But for any item, 
I'm saying that I should use only a small part of this power. I'm not allowed to use everything together. So it's like saying, suppose you have a, a language, your language has many, many words, so it can express a lot of many different things. But if you want to express one idea and so on, you can use only a small, tiny subset of the words. You cannot use everything. That's not allowed. Okay? Which is essentially what we do, right? In, in, in normal language, I think. Okay, so how does that work in practice? You still want to reconstruct the uh, input from the output, so I still have exactly the same cost function. But now I have an extra term which will uh, cost me a lot if the H's are large. So this is some function, so potential over the H's, which grows when the H's are large. Ideally, the H's should be close to zero, zero or something very small. Okay, so that means that... Um, yes, I mean, what do you mean by your subset? Okay, so you have to tune, you, they, they compete, so you have to tune the relative strengths. If this is too small, these coefficients in front of that, then there will be no, 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 no incentive to be sparse, so that means obviously you will have this open representation and you'll encode anything, uh, nothing. If this is too large, everything will be zero and this term will be terrible. So you have to tune. It's a competition. So it's an interesting competition because you want to be very good in reconstructing the input, but you want to be, to, to be as parsimonious as possible. Okay, so that's an interesting idea. Okay, so that's the, is it clear yeah, for the idea? Okay, so let me show you some examples of autoencoders with these ideas of sparsity and without the idea of sparsity. And I have extracted this from, from, from some papers. So what these people have done, they are looked at images of real world. Uh, by real world, there was two classes of images. Um, images from natural landscapes that you can see here, and images from man-made landscapes. Okay? And this is the size of images. So the, that was done some time ago when the images were still... Now you can do much better, obviously, but it doesn't change the conclusion, I think. Okay. So now what you can do is... Um, of course, if you do... Linear autoencoders, what we know is that basically you are doing is, uh, is principal component analysis, right? So you should first compute the covariance of the data and then diagonalize it, find the modes and find the eigenvalues and so on. So what you can do is look at the statistics and compute the correlation matrix here. So this gamma ij now is going to be a gamma or c of r, r prime, where r and r prime are the coordinates of two pixels. So the indices i and j are two dimensional indices, they are vectors. Um, and then you diagonalize and you find the top eigenvalues, exactly what we did before on the blackboard, right? So now what you see, uh, these are the top components. They are very close to Fourier modes, what you would expect from Fourier modes in 2D, two dimension. And the reason is quite simple, is that when you have an image on natural landscapes, so you take a photo here or you take it here, the statistics is the same. So there is invariance of the translation. So you would expect that when you have a a model or statistical model which is invariant under translation, the eigenmodes are Fourier modes, they are plane waves. And this is what you find, essentially. Obviously, this is not exact here because it's not perfectly invariant under translation, but this is more or less what you get. Actually, you have another uh, invariance, which is some kind of invariance under rotation, which is not perfect, but for natural landscapes, in many cases, you can basically rotate a little bit, it doesn't change the statistics. For man-made landscape, when you are building, that's not true. Usually buildings, you know, except if you are in Pisa, maybe, the buildings are, are vertical. So that, that biases some direction, right? Um, okay, so this is what you get. You get the Fourier modes, so, and you know what you're, you're high. So now let me go to the idea of, of the sparse autoencoder. So that, that's taken from this paper, uh, which is uh, <coughs> about um, less, a bit less than 20 years ago. So, uh, again, that was exactly the same thing. He had small images, 10 by 10, so 100 pixels, and the same size of the output layer, and then he had some uh, in, um, hidden layer which was the same size. So P prime was equal to P. And here is the transfer function. So that basically tells you um, how the units here are computed from these uh, values here. So it's a specification of this function F. So this transfer function is not at all linear. That's called a, you know, it's a sigmoidal function. 
So it's something which is, um, so it's uh, in between zero and one. So the pixel were, I think, black and white, so there were zero and one, so you wanted some representation which does something like that. Zero and one. And I think the sparsity, so just, I'm just finishing. And the sparsity condition, I have to go back to the paper, I didn't write it, that's a mistake. I think it was about 10% of the, of the um, uh, hidden uh, units are active. They have some, you know, that are different from zero. But I should go to the paper to see precisely how that was on. Sorry, yeah. Yes. But, but, but you, in the... Well, I mean, but, but... When you do maximum entropy, you, have, you also say maximum entropy under what kind of constraints? So here, the, that's a crucial point, right? So what is the important statistics? So it depends on what you call mode, but you know, not everything is conserved in the model. I mean, it's reproduced from the data. You produce only some lower order statistics. Typically, this is what people do. So it's a way to have a model with low dimension compared to you know, the most powerful model you can think of. Usually, the number of constraints you put is small compared to the, everything you could think of. For instance, you constrain only one-point statistics, two-point statistics when you are n variables. You do not constrain on the n over two-point statistics. So it's a, you get only you know n square coefficient essentially compared to two to the n, for instance, for naive model. So it's 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 a very small p prime in a way. <coughs> I want to show some extension of this uh, recitable span machine to make the connection. Yeah, I hope I will be able to say so. Okay, so this is what you get from this uh, paper. So, so you see you get 100 hidden units here. So each one has a pattern of 100 weights connecting to this image, image 10 by 10. So you can represent the weights by a 10 by 10 image also. Okay? So the dot, the, the black dot means, I think, positive one. The, uh, y dot means negative ones of the opposite, I don't remember, the matter. And the gray one means close to zero. And what you see are these, um, um, this pattern of weights connecting the hidden units to the visible unit, to the uh, input unit. Uh, so now we see something which has nothing to do with this extended Fourier mode, right? But we see something which is much more localized in the sense that what are these units computing? So some units are not doing much, but other ones are doing interesting things. So let's look at this one, for instance. What is it doing? Or let's say maybe a simpler one. Uh, let me see. Uh, are all a bit so this one, for instance. What is this one doing? Or this one? So you take, for instance, negative values here, positive values here, and zero here. So what you are doing is you compute a first-order derivative along this direction here, from the north uh, west corner to the southeast, right? Because if I take this, I do the dot product with the image, I will, all the pixels which are here will have a negative signs, all the pixels here will have a positive signs. So if more or less the, two, the sum of the weights here is zero, and then what I do, I will compute the relative con contrast here from in this region minus what is going on in this region. So it's a kind of local derivative. It's a local gradient, gradient along this direction. Okay? Other unit, uh, you see a white, zone, a white zone surrounded by two black zones. That means it com it's computing a local second derivative. So what all these units are doing, they are computing some kind of local uh, first order, second order statistics of the data. Okay? They are computing some gradients of the data, some local contrast in, in the image. In fact, it makes a lot of sense because when you have uniform things, right, uh, a lot of these units will be silent. Because if you have a uniform uh, background, you compute a gradient locally, this is going to be zero. So that will satisfy the sparsity condition very, very nicely. So this unit will detect only edges, for instance. Okay, so let me go now to the, to the next idea, which is one step forward. That's the idea of sparse dictionary learning, which is actually very similar to sparse encoders, but it goes just one step forward. <coughs> So what do, we, what do we have here with fast autoencoders? We have this architecture. We encode 
the input into the representation, and then we decode. And we want the two things to be equal. And the idea was to use a large hidden layer, but with the constraint that only few units should be active. Okay? So sparse representation. Um, so H tells us which are the hidden uh, units which are important, the one with big Hs. And if I look at these things here, I see that essentially what I'm minimizing is the difference between the uh, input and the representation when applied to, uh, when, once I, I apply some transform, it could be linear things or uh, nonlinear ones, with some sparsity here condition. The fact that I am computing this from the input is somewhat, you know, not so important. In fact, I'm asking the question now, can I express my input as a sum of different um, features which correspond to the weights coming from the hidden to the output layer, which are these M primes, M prime, uh, where I have a, a set of features, I have P prime of them, but I want to use only a few of them for each input. Not always the same, but a, a, a small set of P, okay? Among the P prime, which are available. So the idea of sparse dictionary uh, learning is that we should go for the feature directly and forget about the connection between the input and the hidden layer. So this is the idea. Forget about that. Forget about that. Uh, what you could do is, is this. Now you have a machine which has only two layers, the input layer and the hidden layer, formally. Well, I put a, a white square so you can st still see all of it, <laughs> but they shouldn't be here. Okay. So what you say now is that you want to minimize exactly the same thing as before. You have your representation, so you have to find the representation, <coughs> which may have some sparsity condition of some regularization, and this uh, things, this representation should be able to express or to reconstruct the uh, inputs here. It could be a linear function, it could be a non-linear function. And I would like to minimize this on H, which is the representation of V. So it will be one H for each V. And here is going to be my set of features. So that's what people call the, the dictionary. So you, are, you have your ideas, you have your words, and you decide whether you pick up the word or not. So suppose this is zero and one, for instance. Okay, so you have sentences and you have words, and you, you make the sentences. So we want, when we do that, we want to find your representation, but also this M prime, which is a dictionary, a set of features. So again, this is what uh, uh, an example in a famous paper by uh, Olzawan and Field in '96, uh, where they did exactly this thing, and you find results which are very similar to a sparse autoencoder on the same kind of, of uh, inputs, which were uh, 12 by 12 pixel images on natural images. So you see very clearly, this is even better than before, you see this uh, first order derivative computed along the vertical direction here, and you see second order derivatives uh, computed here, for instance. So you get all this kind of... Uh... No, I'm, I'm showing the M prime. M prime. So for H, then for each image, you should, image, you should look at the particular H. I, I don't have this in the, in the paper. No, I agree, I mean, it's important to say. It's this, okay, these are the features, the M prime. So this was actually a big, uh, a big result in the field because for people knowing about neuroscience, when you see that, that's very similar to what is found in experiments. So just to be a little precise, I don't know how much you know about neuroscience, maybe it's not your, your background. But there are, of course, I told you a little bit yesterday about the retina, that was one of the examples I mentioned very briefly but trying to understand how visual inputs are encoded by the retina and then transmitted to the visual cortex. So the retina is the first sensory organ, yes, and then it goes to, 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 to the brain. So in the brain, you get a complex uh, hierarchical structure, essentially, or let's say a layer structure, uh, with the visual cortex here, with different layers, which are called V1, V2, V3, V4, and then it goes to a higher order regions. So if you look at what happens in V1, which is the first layer of the visual cortex, so right after the retina, almost, um, this is what you see. So in these papers, in this paper, um, I have extracted the data from this paper, what you see are receptive fields of neurons in V1. So what these people have done, they have put electrodes uh, measuring the activity of V1 neurons, 
And then they have presented stimuli, landscapes, um, you know, pictures to monkeys. And then you can measure the activity and see how this neuron is actually responding to, um, to these images. So you can compute some receptive field. So one way to do that, you can compute the response for many different images and try to reconstruct the receptive field. Or you can, for instance, show a small spot, bright spot on the screen, and you see what when, when the neuron will be active. And by looking at the map of activity, you can reconstruct where, what this neuron is looking at. And you get exactly that. So you see there is a striking similarity between these things, which are recorded experimentally, and what is found with this machine learning technique. So it seems that it could be the hypothesis is that V1, the first uh, region in the visual cortex, is actually doing some kind of sparse encoding of the images. Okay? It's true that, again, when you have a uniform background and so on, it, there is no point transmitting the information pixel by pixel. What is important is that maybe some edge, some contrast, some change in luminosity, some change in contrast, and so on. And this is what is encoded and transmitted. Okay? So there is a whole field now of people in neuroscience trying to connect, actually, uh, what you find in this different region to what people find in machine learning when they do training. So I just wanted to, to evoke this field, which I find interesting. Oh, you mean seeing in a different... Um, So the experiments I'm aware of are, are for cats. That was done in cats, that was done in monkeys. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a good question, but I'm ignorant. I'm too much ignorant. So we should see whether people have done experiments in other animals, which are very different um, for V1. <coughs> and they are all mammals. I mean, they're on, on their own, I mean, this one, I mean, cats are, they are close to humans in some way. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, apart from neuroscience in other biological areas, for example, in cell biology, uh, if you have linear functions like that, they look sort of like first order chemical reaction rates and so on. And perhaps it's possible for, say, single celled organisms also to do auto encoding in order to. Uh, perhaps transmit information or something like that. Are such things known or have they been modeled? Yeah, there have been a lot of works, I mean, on how information is, uh, you know, when you have also sensory information, so that would be the presence or not of chemicals which are detected by sensors, you know, binding to transmembrane proteins and so on on the, on the, on the cell um, um, surface, then how this is uh, integrated by the uh, chemical networks or, let's say, the uh, gene regulatory networks. So, so there have been a lot of works about how information is processed. Uh, in particular, so one thing which is important in, in this particular context is what I call denoising before. I mean, the chemical signal you can get is very noisy, okay? I mean, you can have very low concentration chemicals, for instance. So the question is how to have reliable uh, decisions which are taken from noisy signal. So in some way, you want to reconstruct some kind of pure signal. From, so there that, that, that have been some works. I'm not aware of, uh, you know, the, uh, an exact connection or let's say precise connection between neural nets and what you are suggesting, but I know there are a whole field of works in the, how information is processed by, by, by cell, by bacteria and eukaryotic cells. Maybe this is not precise enough for, for an answer, but... Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. I mean... Um, I don't know, maybe there are some, uh, yeah, we could make a more uh, precise connection between these two approaches, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know, I mean, for, I mean, here you have stripes in all directions, so I think, that in principle, you should not, you should be able to reconstruct any kind of information. Um, the, um, I mean, there are some famous experiments where, for instance, cats were not able to recognize vertical stripes or horizontal stripes, one over two, I don't know, but because they were uh, born, in an uh, artificial environment in a lab, and they were never, uh, they never experienced these vertical stripes, you know, during development. And then when they get a little bit older, they are not able to see them. So they will bump into bars, vertical bars. So this is clearly something which is acquired during development, this kind of uh, structure. Now for predators, I mean, the uh, situation is complex. I think the velocity is very important. You see, for instance, the black dot growing in size, and you know, then you have to react. If something is changing very fast, this is not detected by this kind of thing. So that's another mechanism, right? And then you have to make decisions very quickly. I mean, 
trying to avoid and, and run away and so on. So there are special pathways to, to take these decisions. Yeah, okay. So I have two minutes for the second part, so which I think um, uh, maybe I can, yes, um, yes, I can do that in the second lecture. Yes, okay. I try to uh, short, to cut this in short pieces. So what we'll, we'll see is, you see, I mean, just one thing I want to, uh, and then I will finish. We ended up with this architecture. When you have data on one layer, and we have representation on the other layer. So we, what I would like to show in the, in the afternoon is exactly the same architecture, but in the context of statical physics, which was actually also introduced in machine learning some years ago, which are called recipe Boltzmann machines. So I will show you how we can define some energy, some joint distribution for representation and, and data and so on, and how this is actually deeply connected to usual models in statistical mechanics and how this can be used in practice for data analysis. So I will stop here and then we'll do it next week. Thank you. <laughs> in in where, sorry? Part of your talk. Here in on the rest of the machine? Uh, no no no. no. When you allowed H to have any take any value. So there's no there's no constraint on H now. H can take any value. It can take any value, but there is a potential here. Right. So it will cost you a lot if you want it to make big. Yes. There's no other constraint. And, yeah. No. I mean, the, the size. So you have to decide the size of the vector. Yeah. So I'm just uh, curious about why. I'm wondering why does this do so well uh, compared to the uh, compared to the or to the situation one? where H was actually. By that. that honestly, I don't know. I mean, it was done, you know. Uh, um, I, I don't know. We should look at the details. Maybe, you know, there were some choices which were made here, which were maybe poor choices, and we have to be careful about it. this choice of S. Maybe was not optimal, you know. I, I don't know what. It, it might be in the details, and there is nothing uh, very general here. Could you say it again, please? Uh, are there any sort of general um, things you can say about <clears throat> the design principles when you're constructing F and G, for example? Or is it really just try things and see which works best? Yeah, so there are classes of F and Gs that people use. So, <coughs> but, I mean, these are presumably things they've tried, or what, is it like. Yes, but I mean. If you look at the literature in machine learning, for instance, and I looked at it in case of uh, Residual Boltzmann machine uh, quite uh, precisely. First of all, it's, it's very hard because there are many, many papers. And typically people, they have their, they have their own transfer function they like very much. You know? So some people like very much the, the white one. That's called the Bernoulli uh, transfer function, some kind of sigmoidal. Other people like very much the pink one, which is called rectified linear units. And they fight and they say, uh, okay, this one is works better on this particular database and it seems to be true and this one is working better and there are some kind of uh, waves of different patients going on. So I'm not sure there is a deep understanding. I mean, you can see, I mean, you have to think of uh, about two things when you say what is the best one. The best one may be the one giving more performance, I mean, better performance. And maybe the pink one is, is good, you know, because if you look at, the, at this one, this one saturates. Um, so saturation is not very uh, nice because if you want to express not only that the feature is present in the data, but to which degree it is present, the pink one is coming with information, this one is not. Okay? So there is, that's a good argument to use this one. But then that another problem is that the, the other problem is the learning, the practical problem. You want to learn the weights, and when you have some saturation, you get much more stability, you don't get divergences and things like that. So it's actually easier to learn with this function than with this one when you get things which can grow to infinity and so on. So these are two objectives which are, you know, uh, different. So you have to understand what is the best function and what is the easiest one to learn. I mean, what is the, the one which makes learning the easiest one? And, uh, and there is some fight in the papers. I think there is some 
In many papers now, people on, in deep networks or so, people use this rectified linear unit. It seems to be well under control in terms of learning also. So the, the, idea, the idea behind this, this thing is that it's always the same idea. So if I, maybe I should just say one more word about that because just to give some intuition. You see, you have H here, and here you have the dot product between M and V. <coughs> this is what we are talking about, right? I'm looking at one hidden unit, and it sees the visible layer with some weights, compute the dot product, and then updates its value according to this function. So, V is some vector in a high dimensional space, and M is another vector. And basically, you are, you are looking at whether they are orthogonal. In that case, you, you'll be here, and that's most of the most of the time, this is the case. And sometimes they are aligned, or let's say, close to be aligned. Then you are in this region. It's a big dot product. So the idea is that if you have a big dot product, that's probably a signal. It means that your data really look like M. So you should really take this into account. So when you are here, big dot product, H should be large. That's, that's real information, that signal. Now, the larger the dot product, the larger the value of H. Right? Makes sense. Now. If a dot product is small, then you know, that's probably it's not a signal. Just it happens that they're almost orthogonal and you know, there might be a little bit of noise. So probably if you are here, you don't want to take this seriously. So maybe you should shut down H. So this is the idea that the slope here is large and the slope here should be small. Limiting case is that the slope is equal to zero. And then the simplest thing you can think of is this with some threshold. Now, why you don't get anything to the negative values? Well, you could have the same thing. That's quite possible. Or you can say, I'm measuring how much my feature is present in the data, and I want this presence to be only a positive number. I, I, I cannot be present minus three times. You know? That doesn't make sense. So you put zero everywhere. And it's not a very big um, constraint, actually, because you could have another hidden unit with exactly the same weight with a negative sign and it would make up for this part of the curve. So people use, most people use rectified linear units, which are this one. Oh, nice. Yes. Exactly. So where you put the threshold is a crucial thing, but that can be learned from the data and choose the optimal value of theta. I'll show that if necessary.